This is a Triple J podcast. What's the difference between heat and temperature? Are people getting taller? And could octopus take over the world? My name's Lucy Smith. We got into these topics and heaps more in this episode of Science with Dr. Carl. Let's jump in. Have you learned anything this week? Uh, yes, that we still don't fully understand the story with toilets and okay. putting the lid up and down. Uh, putting the lid up and down as far as uh, minimising germs? germs? Yeah. Right. And the phrase is, if you leave the lid up, comma, you are brushing your teeth with toilet water. Oh, yeah, because all the, all the particles get in the air and... Yeah. What, so, what's the truth to it? Well, it's getting hard. What I really want is that they do a study where they use some sort of fancy military technology or Schlerin photog- uh, photography where they look at the currents in the air and see where they go from the toilet bowl. So what they claim is it's something like a military airstrike on an undefended civilian city where everything just goes blowing up in all directions. And the experiment was done just recently where they had a whole bunch of culture plates. So they've got a bacterium and a known bacterium and they shoved it into toilet water and then either flush with the lid up or down. And and there were like a half a dozen culture plates, one on the top of the toilet cistern, some on the toilet seat or the lid, depending on whether it was up or down, some on the floor, some in line with the toilet. And what they found was that you had maybe eight colonies of bacteria with the lid up and three with the lid down. But why would you have any at all yeah. with the lid down? Like, oh, there's, so there's only a little air gap at the front. Does that mean the air comes sort of shooting out at high... Mate, I just want to know more. But overall, the lesson is you should you flush with a lid down, but the science is still not strong enough. I want the definitive study where I see those nasty bacteria flying through the air and, and sort of coming out at high speed. I want to actually see the jet of air. You want to see it. You want, want to see, see it. those germs. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, Dr. Carl, we're going to get into some questions now. Yeah. And if you've got one, 0439 757 text it in. Oscar and Kellyville, you are kicking us off and there's something that you kind of tell people. You've got a bit of a law in your family. What is it? Hi, doctors. Um, my and my brother, we're two years apart, but we look very similar and we're actually conceived on the same day because my parents used IVF. Does that mean we are twins if we come from the same, like, release, if you know what I mean? Ah, well... You get wisdom from many different places. In this case, I got it from the movie called The Irishman, where Robert De Niro is a crim, and part of what he learns is it is what it is. So at some stage, when things have just gone really bad or good, whatever it is, is what it is. So now, in one case, you've got two separate eggs from the mother, your mother, but one of them got sort of frozen for a bit longer than the other one. So in one sense you are twins and in another sense you are not. And as Robert De Niro says, it is what it is. So both are true. It's sort of like you you are quantum twins. There you are. Yeah, right. You are both twins and not twins. It's like sometimes I find at home when sometimes people don't put the little things away properly in the cupboard after emptying the dishwasher and you, and you think the lid is shut. You think the door to the container for the plastic containers, yeah, the, the door to that cupboard is shut and you open it and then suddenly a plastic container falls on you. That is a quantum container. It is both inside the cupboard and outside depending on whether you open the door or not. Yeah. So you are both a twin and not a twin at the same time. You and your twin are entangled. All right. So Oscar is able to kind of say to people, yeah, we're twins. And at the same time, not, Mm. depending on the birthday. So both are true at the same time. Think quantum and you'll be safe. And Oscar, you do look pretty similar, did you say? Yeah, we look really similar and we always get, are we twins? And when we explain that he's two years younger than me, people are always shocked. So, Oh. That's so interesting. Yeah. All oh, right. wow. Look, thank you, Oscar, for getting yeah. us off to a good start. <laughs> thank, you. thank you very much. I know. I like that. Yes and no. We've got Ella from Nam Now, Ella, solar eclipse. We're seeing the videos from New York. What, what's your question? Yeah. Hi, Dr. Carl and hi, Dr. Lacey. Um My question is, uh, it's my understanding that um, a solar eclipse can only really happen when it's a new moon. Um, I'd love to understand a bit more of that. But hypothetically, if it didn't occur during a, a, sorry, a new moon, I should say, regret that, uh, didn't occur during a new moon, um, would we have witnessed something happen to our moon while the US was seeing their solar eclipse? 
Ah, well, the shadow on the Earth from the moon, so you've got the sun, you know, 150 million kilometres away, and then you've got the moon about 400,000 kilometres away, and then you've got us. And we have to be in a dead straight line looking at it from above and from below, uh, from the side. So if you look at it from above, often you'll say, oh, look, the moon goes around the Earth every 29 and a half days. Why don't we have an eclipse every 29 and a half days? But then when you look at it from the side, you'll see that it's either above that line or below that line. And the when you multiply the two periods together, 29 and a half days and 27 days and a bunch of decimal points, you end up with something like 18 years, 10, and, uh, 10 days and one third of a day. So um, the spot can range from zero up to a maximum of around 260 kilometres in diameter. And in this occasion, the spot, the shadow on the Earth was 150 kilometres and it was photographed from space. So you've got the totality where, and I've seen about, I've been to about four or five eclipses and it just goes black. And what happens to animals is one of three things. Either they go to sleep or they get upset or they just don't care. Same as humans. And then um, the spot goes over you at a few thousand kilometres an hour and it's gone after anything between about one and seven minutes. Then outside that central spot where you get blackness, you look in the sky and where the sun used to be there's this black thing. Outside that you've got this crescent and you should not look at that crescent with the naked eye or you will end up with a crescent burnt into your retina. And it happens every time there's an eclipse and some will come through from this eclipse. And then the rest of the world, nothing. If you're outside the zone of partial eclipse, you've got nothing. And the weird thing is this. We've been able to predict eclipses for, or know the records of them for thousands of years. How do they keep those records together? Because to be able to predict eclipses, you need a range of scientists running all the way from, we'll pick Spain in Europe, all the way across Europe, the Middle East, and then across Russia, Siberia, and all the way across to China. And we have no idea of the network, but it must have existed, where the scientists would put their secret readings together. Because if you see a total eclipse, that's really obvious, the sky's gone black. But Mm. if it's a partial eclipse, you don't really notice it because your eyes are good at adjusting. But only if the, the way you'd notice it is if you've got a trained apprentice and you say, you're an apprentice scientist and your job is to every day look at the shadow underneath that tree where there are lots of leaves. And when the shadows go into little ellipses, little crescents, that's when a partial eclipse is and you've got to tell us. And so... There must have been this secret network of scientists predicting them over all of the years. So can you clarify what happened the other day in the US? So the sun and the moon and the earth were in the exact straight line and it began around Texas and then swept its way up towards New York and it was a a really nice eclipse and a lot of people had good weather Um, and Fox TV said that this would lead to an increase in illegal migrants coming out of Mexico (laughs) because they'd use those four minutes to rush across the border. In the darkness? In the the darkness, as though in the middle of the day everybody would just go to sleep. I don't know. Wow. All right. (laughs) So... Is that kind of answering your question? I don't think I have actually answered it. No, that's okay. I think um, the second part of it was that if they say... So eclipses can't happen during a full moon. Is that correct? Uh, A full moon? uh, You can have the other sort of eclipse. You can have the shadow of the Earth going on the moon. So then you have the lunar eclipse during the full moon. So then in line, what you've got is the sun and then the Earth... And the earth throws a shadow behind it from the sun. And this shadow is like a big cone. And usually the moon goes above or below this cone of shadow, but occasionally goes through that. And using that, the Greeks were able two and a half thousand years ago to measure the distance between the earth and the moon. And we might talk about that another time. Okay. All right. Thanks, Ella. Yeah, thank you so much. We've got Angus in Avoca Beach. Angus, what's your question? Hey, doctors. Uh, Dr. Carl, many years ago, said that at age of two, you're half of your final height. Kind of, and yeah. I've been testing it with my own kids. Yeah. And it was very accurate. But there's one other thing I'm wondering. My, all my kids were taller than my wife by the time they finished primary school. Mm-hmm. And two of my kids are taller than me. Now, I'm guessing your kids are pretty tall too, Dr. Carl. Yeah, my son's just under under two metres, yeah. And I'm wondering why 
with they have the same DNA as us, and we gave it to them. They should be an average of our heights, but they're all taller. Yeah. <laughs> What's going on? Um, a mixture of vaccination to reduce infections plus better nutrition. And the importance of the infections is that when you get an infection and if you happen to have been pre-programmed as a child to go through a growth spurt, you miss out. So the traditional curves, you've seen the curves in the blue book, have you, Angus? You know, where the kids sort of grow evenly all the way up? Yeah. Yeah, okay. When they actually measure them, they've found that in one case, a kid grew nothing for four months and then 18 millimetres in one night. 18 millimetres. Mate, that's huge. Mm. That's like the thickness of your thumb. And the kids talk about growing pains. Oh, it hurts, mummy, hurts, daddy. And the parents say, oh, it's just growing pains. They're right. So the thing is that there are, that was an extreme case, that one. But in general, you have pre programmed growth spurts as you're growing taller. And if you happen to have an infection during that time, it might stop that growth spurt from happening. The other thing is better nutrition. Now, when the uh, colonists, colonialists, colonialists in uh, the United States, which was still part of England back in the seven, early 1700s, when they started their revolution against the mother country of the Great Britain, on average, the people living in that country, which would become the USA, were about half a head taller than the people that they were fighting wow. because of the better nutrition. Much, and they weren't in cities and there weren't all these diseases rolling through. And for most of the next two centuries, the Americans were the tallest people on earth. And then that changed after the Second World War for various reasons. The American health system went bad. Uh, their diet went bad. The tallest people on earth are now the Dutch. And the system in Holland is that if you are a woman and you are pregnant, you just by yourself can ring up an obstetrician and saying, this is happening to me, uh, and you don't have to sort of muck around. You can just go straight to the obstetrician. And for the first couple of years after birth, if anything goes wrong, you just ring up the paediatrician. It's not like you go to see the nurse to the GP. You just go straight to the paediatrician and they look after the kids. And we think that's why the Dutch are currently the tallest people on earth. Why? Because they've got such hands-on... They've got total care. So they look at your kid and they say, oh, there's nothing wrong with your kid. That's fine. Or they'll say, actually, there's something going on and we'll give them an antibiotic for something, you know, to stop this infection going through. Because the thing with infectious diseases is a little bit is good because it trains your immune system, but too much is bad. Mm. And in the case of my daughter Lola, she nearly died at the age of one because she was at baby jail and she ended up getting cellulitis, uh, infection of the skin around her eyeball, oh, and she went and had a fever, got paralysed down one side of her body. My wife noticed and said, look, she's a bit red around that eye, not much, and they gave her IV antibiotics. And on the tip of the needle as it went in, she perked up and stopped being paralysed down one side of her body. Wow. So... Life is kind of so, – so being able to have access to the medical care is really good. And unfortunately in Australia, we've got a kind of a messy system because of our population. Mm. We've got half the population of England, which could be all stuffed into half of Victoria. So we should have a healthcare system that says – we need people spread across the country. Anybody who lives away from a major teaching hospital, you get free transport to the hospital and a family relative can come along and you get accommodation in the city because you come across so many people who just can't make it from a country area and so the health in country areas is so much lower than in the city areas. And that would make us taller? That would, well, if we had better <laughs> health care, we would get taller, yeah. That was a long and complicated I know, thing. I know, Sorry. a rad about, but it's all there. Dr Carl, thank you so much. We got a question here from Jono in Mount Evelyn, which says, can you please ask Dr. Carl if he does in fact endorse the blood pressure product that is all over my socials or if it is a hoax? Now, Dr. Carl, this is something that we flagged last week, but I reckon we keep flagging it because you have been, I guess, one of a few ABC presenters who have gotten caught up in this kind of AI hoax, fake ads across meta at the moment. What's going on? What's the update? Uh, as an ABC person, I do not endorse anything. 
anything that is supposedly advertised by me, a commercial product, is a total con. It gets worse. You pay the $65 for the product that they advertise, and they claim, wrongly, that I'm a professor. Oh, no, I dream of being a professor at Monash. No, I'm at Sydney. And then they make other claims about me. And then they say, send us $65. You go on and you put in your credit card for $65. Firstly, you don't receive the product. Secondly, because they're rat bags, they charge you somewhere in the mid-300s. Crazy. Not a 1000 because that might flag the interest of your credit card provider and not less than 65 They go for the mid-300s and everybody is being charged and F- Facebook knows that this is going on. Now, there is a game that you might have seen at the Easter show called Whack-A-Mole where you've got all these mm. heads sticking up and you bang down one, another one that comes up somewhere else. This is not Whack-A-Mole. These are the same people over and over again and so... They're ridiculously easy to pick who they are and we pick them and we've been getting them notified to Facebook and they vanish and they come back immediately. And apparently the only thing needed for them to be able to tell lies is that they have money. Yeah. Right. And I feel sorry for the people who have been charged 365 because then they ring up their bank and the bank says, but you say it's only 65, but it's $365 here. Uh, and then it takes them an hour out of their life. And Facebook knows what's going on and refuses to block. It's happened to bigger people. I'm only small fry. It happened to Andrew Forrest and Gina Reinhardt and Dick Smith, you know, millionaires and billionaires, and they can't stop it. Mm-hmm. So it seems as though we've lost some truth. So I'm sorry. It was a con. Yeah. And unfortunately, they've made it ridiculously easy. Um, Let me just see if I can show this thing to you here. Um, Here we go. Um, Scams, blurb, voice. Where's the bill? Okay. I now have a little... Um, data point of where I create of how easy it is to fake voices. Wow! So this has just been released the other day. I'm going to bring the microphone, turn the microphone on, and this is the person's original voice. Here it comes, and it'll play now. Playing now. As a bilingual individual fluent in both English and Portuguese, I'm contributing my voice to the Leafox project. This recording is intended to assist non-verbal individuals in expressing themselves more fully while preserving the nuances of both languages. Okay, so, so what's that? That was a person who is, uh, can speak fluently English and Portuguese and that 15-second blurb was given to OpenAI, which can create anything. Okay. The next thing you're going to hear is him speaking as a fake voice in English And it's totally made up. Okay. And it sounds just like him. Here it goes. I just recorded it yesterday. Excuse me. Can I get your attention? Thank you for your help. Can we watch a movie tonight? Could you please help me find my glasses? Thank you for your understanding. It means a lot to me. So with that 15 seconds, they've been able to manipulate it into saying whatever... It wants, really. And the thing that is really insulting about all the fake videos, they haven't even gone out to use this new software on my voice. I sound like I'm drunk. <laughs> I mean, good day, I'm Carl, and you, I've invented this new thing, <laughs> slur, slur. Mate, they even, th- this is available on OpenAI. So Ex- this is a public service announcement that if you see these ads that it is not Dr. Carl, no ABC presenter or Dr. Carl will ever endorse or say that you should purchase a commercial product. Let's get back to the questions. Got Pat Thank from Oran Park here. Pat, you got a question about chilies? Good morning, doctors. Good morning, Doctor Pat. Uh, yeah, about chilies. So I, I dabble with heat. I love it. Like the hottest pepper, I'll go for it. Why does it always seem that your tongue is on fire, your lips only tingle, but your cheeks and your throat don't pop anything? Ah, by the way, what's the maximum you've been able to go up to on the Scoville scale? Do you, do you, have you heard about the Scoville scale, Doctor Lucy? Uh, no, I oh, the Scoville scale is how you measure chilies, and most people are happy at around four hundred or something. Um, the maximum is sixteen million. That's the pure capsaicin, and when you get some of the ghost chilies, they're up in the thousands or tens of thousands. What, what can you do, Pat? 
Um, I'm not sure of the, the most extreme I've done, but I've got a million Scoville chocolate fudge at home, and that's pretty good. A million? Oh, my god! My God, how can you have my, – my son and I had a competition, and I gave up when we were both sweating profusely over our whole bodies, and we each, because we're related, had a similar area on our faces going from the corner of each lip up towards the cheekbone and down where we lost all sensation. And at that stage, I gave up and he kept on going. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so you're saying why does it hurt in your mouth but not on the way down? The reason that anything happens inside your body is the old lock and key receptor thing. In this case, the, when, when the key goes in the lock, something happens. The key is the molecule called capsaicin, and you have capsaicin receptors, which confusingly are called VR1 receptors, van, vanilloid receptor ones, but you've got lots on your tongue. And fewer down your throat and none down there. And some people have them on their rectum and some people don't. So some people get the ring of fire and some people don't. Mm. Birds don't get it. So okay. birds can eat chilies and they can then spread the seeds anywhere. So it's because you don't have those receptors, Dr. Pat, further down your uh, gut pathway that you don't feel the pain. Yeah, right. That's cool. Okay. Thanks, Pat. We've got Effie in Sydney here. Now, Effie, what's your question? Hello, doctors. Dr. Effie. Um, so I'd like to know what impact does trauma, specifically grief, have on your memory, both um, short and long term? Um, there's a lot of people having trauma around the place. I never really realised this until I was a medical doctor and I was working with the people from the Vietnam War. And what we've discovered recently is epigenetic changes. Let me, let me explain. Now, you've heard about DNA, that molecule that looks like a twisted ladder? Yeah. Right. So that one way of looking at it is that it is a blueprint for, on one hand, making a whole new human being from scratch, but on a day-to-day -day basis for running your memories. And what can happen is that the DNA itself doesn't change, but trauma can affect how it is read. And what happens is that little methyl groups, um, CH3, one carbon, three hydrogens, they get stuck onto individual rungs of the DNA ladder of life and that bit just gets not read. It gets skipped over and then things happen further down the line in terms of your memory. We first discovered this from... The history books when we discovered in Europe when there was a famine caused by oppressors of, in war that the babies born would be small but the babies of the babies would be small. And it really came through in the Second World War in Holland where the Nazis cut off food to the Dutch at the end of the Second World War and the women gave birth to small babies, which you expect, but those small babies then gave birth to small babies and that's how we discovered the molecular basis. So we think that the effect of trauma on causing interferences with how your, re your brain runs and your body runs is by these, at least, these methyl groups being attached to different parts of your DNA. There's probably a dozen other ones, but this is the first one we discovered. Uh, are you okay with all this? Are you yeah, you give me some things to Google, but yeah, no, that's great. I hope it's okay so, thank in your you. family and your personal life and stuff. Yeah, yeah, but it's all good. There, oh. there, there are, check with your GP, there are ways to get help on this. Yeah, yeah. and if Thanks you too. are feeling it today, you can always give Lifeline a call on 13 11 14. We've got Kai in Canberra here. Kai, you've got a question about electric vehicles. Yeah, hey doctors. Um, my question is, are electric vehicles really better for the environment than like fuel cars because... They use a lot more fuel to mine the lithium for the electric cars. Ah, um, there's an article uh, in a podcast by The Guardian three weeks ago, The Science Guardian. They came to a world expert on this and this is how it works. If you get an electric vehicle and you manufacture it using fossil fuels and then you manufacture the electricity using fossil fuels, your energy payback time is that after about 40,000 kilometres, you're ahead. So after a lousy 40,000 kilometres, even if you make the car using fossil fuels and power it using fossil fuels, you're still ahead because the big advantage is this. If you've got a fuel tank with 100 units of energy, if that's liquid energy, like diesel or petrol, only 30 units of that energy goes to pushing the car down the road. The risk gets turned into heat. But if it's electricity, about 95 units 
get turned into electricity, into pushing you down the road. And that gives them a great advantage. And the beauty of it is that if every car in Australia was electric, you'd be able to, and they, and they could be plugged into the houses, the grid could go down and you could run all of electricity, all of Australia's houses off the cars for about a week. So your average car, electric car with a big battery, 500 to 1,000 kilometres, 100 kilowatt hours. 100 kilowatt hours will run our place for 12 days. So that means if I plug the car into the house, I can go off the grid and run our house for 12 days. Our house is super efficient. Other people are not so efficient. So averaging it out across Australia a week. So your the, the electric cars will provide a way of sucking electricity from the grid and giving it back. Mm. Now, already there are councils around Australia that every time they put in or repair a, a light pole or a telegraph pole, they put in a charging station. If you go way back to 1880 when... In August 1880, Bertha Benz had the world's first car journey, 100 kilometres to visit her mother in Gottlieb Benz's car, which then turned into Mercedes Benz. The number of petrol stations in the world was zero. Mm. And the way she got her fuel was she'd drop into East chemist shop on the 100 kilometre journey and say, sell me all your benzene. And they'd say, no, we need it for dry cleaning. And so she used up all their benzene. And that was in 1880. 1880, was, that was the world's first car journey. And if you watch the movie Thelma and Louise, it has a happier ending than Thelma and Louise. Wow. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Well, Kai, thank you so much for your question. We've got Mac in Brisbane here. Mac, you've got a question about space. Hey, doctors. Dr. Mac, welcome. My question is, how is space cold if there's no particles to subtract the heat from you? Is it because the very few particles in space are just super cold? Yeah, you kind of got it. Now, there's a big difference between heat and temperature. And when you do physics, you'll learn the difference. Heat is energy. Temperature is how fast individual atoms or molecules are moving. So at one stage, in down the corridor from me, we had a machine that could make temperatures hotter than the centre of the sun. Wow. 20 million degrees. But there were very few atoms at that temperature. So the atoms were moving really fast, but there were very few atoms. And when you, sure, those atoms have got a colossal amount of energy, but there's only a few atoms. And we worked out there was not enough energy, even though it was hotter than the center of the sun, there wasn't enough heat energy to boil an egg. Okay, so just keep that in the background, that heat is energy, and there wasn't enough energy because there weren't enough molecules to boil an egg. Sure, they were, the energies, the molecules that were there were really hot, but their temperature was really high, but the energy wasn't enough. What would have happened to that building if the temperature was there, that it, if it really was that hot? Um, if, if it was able to get out, it would have, the molecules, the very few of them, would have damaged stuff and just gone through metal like it wasn't there. Wow. And so we had super powerful magnetic fields holding it in the shape of a donut. And the Russian word for donut is tokamak. So look up tokamak nuclear reactor. And we had one of those running for a little while. So getting back to the temperature of space, the number of molecules, I forget what it is, it's of the order of, say, one molecule in, in deep space between the galaxies. Every cup, every you know, 20 mils or something, 40 mils, there's not many of them. And their temperature might be high, but there's not many of them, so the overall heat is low. Their temperature, in fact, turns out to be low because they're not getting heated up by the sun, so their temperature is about three degrees above absolute zero. Now, I've covered a whole lot of ground there, Mac, and I might not have answered what you asked for. Yeah, I think you have. Thank you. It's a complicated topic. So just remember, temperature and heat are different. And we went to space recently. We had an episode all about it with our friendly astronomer, which you can check out ah. via our podcast feed. We've got Steph in my engine here. Now, Steph, you have a question about birds. Yes. Uh, hi, Dr. Carl and Dr. Lucy. Um, my question today is um, just something that I've observed from watching birds in my backyard. Um, but birds, um, the birds' eye colours are sort of wildly different from what I would consider sort of standard human eye colours. So, um, like, for example, the currawongs have, like, yellow eyes and then the magpies sort of have very kind of reddy, red-coloured eyes as well. Um, and I, I just thought about it too, that, our, that a lot of cats 
seem to have yellowy eye colours as well. So I'm wondering why animal eye colours are so um, different from like the the, hum- the spectrum of colours that humans have. So with humans, we've got that white bit and then we've got the coloured bit, the iris. Now, I know how the colour happens in the human iris. There's not a blue dye or a green dye or a brown dye. There's only one dye and it's called melanin, M-E-L-A-N-I-N, related to melatonin and, uh, and also those melanomas, same sort of chemical. There's only one dye and depending on how dense it is, how many particles you have per, you know, square centimetre, it'll be either, if there's not many, uh, you know, bright blue and then duller blue, then green and work its way down. I do not know the mechanism by which it happens in birds. I sus- by the way, this is called Rally's Law of Scattering, R-A-Y-L-E-I-G-H. So human eye colour is due to melanin particles being of high density or low density. I do not know if birds have got specific dyes. Mm. I'm going to have to check it out. This is homework. Um, thank you, Dr. Steph. And remember, it's not the answer that gets you the Nobel Prize. It's the question. That's it. Thanks, so Steph. Thank you, thank you, Steph, for the thank you very extra much. homework. We're just thinking about it. We've got Jeff in Sydney. Jeff, what is your question? Yeah, hello. hi, doctors. Um, we know that um, gravity affects the passage of time and we rely on cesium clocks around the world to keep track of time. And I just wanted to know whether all those clocks have to be at the same height above sea level to keep in sync. I mean, how does that all work? Ah, so it was Einstein. Okay, let's just back up. The latest atomic clock I announced just a few weeks ago is so accurate that in the age of the universe, it would lose or gain time by one second out of 14 billion years. It's that precise. And second, so you, so we've got really accurate clocks nowadays. Um, the second thing is that Einstein in 1905 and 1915 said two things about time, which relates to clocks, which is that if you're moving, time slows down. And if you go into a stronger gravitational field, time goes slows down. And we showed this in the movie Interstellar mm. where they hang around near the intense gravitational field of a black hole and well, how much do they age? Like a couple of weeks or something and everybody ages years or something? Yeah. Okay. Our clocks are so accurate that if you had this super, super accurate clock and you lifted it by one-tenth of a millimetre, it would run more slowly and we could measure it. So we have to compensate for that. And also, so that's a gravitational field. And if you sort of tow it behind you on a trailer, like just walking at a few millimetres an hour, we can measure that. So so, so basically yep. they can compensate. They have to compensate. And so right. the classic case is the GPS satellites. So your phone has got five radio transmitter receivers in it, each about the size of the head of a match. If Do people know what matches are anymore? Yeah. Okay, sorry, darling. <laughs> sorry. Okay. So Please. Yeah. Okay, it's a bit smaller than the head of a match. And one of them picks up signals from the GPS satellites. And and, you, and they're at 20,000 kilometres up, which means they're in a weaker gravitational field, so that mucks up their time. So they would go faster, but they're in a uh, – moving at 12,000 kilometres an hour, so their time would go slower. And this means that they would be – uh, out by, I think, 38 microseconds a day. You know, you compensate for the two. What it means is that if we did not fudge the clocks, all the clocks in the GPS satellites are fudged right? to compensate, and if they weren't fudged, you would be out of position by uh, about a kilometre a day. But the other yeah. thing is that these more accurate clocks are going to become more useful, and you're saying, how can a clock be more useful for me? Well, if we can make those clocks a thousand times more accurate in the GPS satellites, when you're looking up where you are, instead of being within five metres of somewhere, you're within five millimetres. Wow. So that's where pure science can affect your daily life. Nicole on the Gold Coast, what is your question? Hey, doctors. Uh, My question is about hypermobility. I'm hypermobile and apparently my bones aren't very dense. So I'd like to know what I can do to increase my bone density so I don't get osteoporosis. Ah, have you been diagnosed with a cause for the hypermobility? Uh, No. Has, if you grab the skin of your, on each side of your neck, how far out can you pull it? 
Um, quite a fair bit. It kind of looks like it's like a decent kind of out to your shoulder blade. blades, out to your shoulder tips. <laughs> Not out to the shoulder blades. No. no okay. Well, yeah, sort of. I guess midway between collarbone. Okay, so there are various collagen things involved. So, have you seen a GP about your hypermobility? No. Okay. Go, luckily, we have good GPs in Australia um, and they're relatively cheap still. So go and see your GP about it and say, I'm worried about my hypermobility and I'm worried I might have Ehlers Danlos, E E H L E R S hyphen Danlos, D A N L O W S syndrome. Uh, but there's a whole bunch of hypermobility syndromes uh, with your collagen. Collagen is the most common protein in your body. Um, and you might have something with that and you might not. And then if you're mentioning this osteoporosis, how do you know you have osteoporosis? I don't have, I'm not aware that I've got osteoporosis, but I've been on those scales that measure your body composition. Ah. And um, it says that my bone mass isn't very high. Okay. So then via the GP, almost certainly you'll get bounced onto a double scan x-ray where they will give you an accurate uh, estimation. And then you'll probably need to talk to a dietitian. Now, it turns out, unfortunately, uh, that you can only lay down new calcium atoms in your body until you're in your early middle 20s. Oh. And after that, mate, that's it. All you can do is keep it the same or it can go down. You can't put any extra. Uh, Claire Collins writes about this on The Conversation. So you need also probably to talk about a dietitian. And with all this knowledge, we'll be able to navigate you successfully through the rest of your life happily. And just quickly, we've got Ainsley in Melbourne here. Ainsley, what's your question about octopus? Hi, doctors. I was just wondering what the evolutionary reason is that octopus do not have communal living and generational learning. And if they did, do you think they could take over the world? Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely they could take over the world. So you, what you've got is an octopus and they are incredibly intelligent and they've got a really good eye and they've got much better mobility than we have because instead of having just um, you know, two arms and two legs, they've got eight of these things and they can even artificially manage to generate a joint in their flexible arm by running electricity up and down and when it meets, that causes an elbow to form temporarily. Oh, but wow. They're all orphans. So what happens is eventually you start off with a single egg and then the single egg turns into, we'll say, a female uh, octopus and then she happens to run across a male octopus and they sort of do the squirty uh, fertilised eggs thing around and so he then dies. He's gone. So he's done his job, he dies. She's got the eggs, she grows them, fertilises them and then she squirts them out and she dies. Every octopus that is born is an orphan and they can't take their knowledge from one generation to the next. And if some of them say, look, I worked out how to make this little suit so we can go on land and take over from these stupid humans, they, they haven't got that ability. Now, why have they ended up with this sort of society where they're all orphans and they don't get together in, commun- in communities? I don't know. The evolutionary biologists would know about this. Check it out on Google Scholar. But it's the old rule of evolution ain't perfect. It's just good enough. It's kind of tragic, isn't it's it? It's sad, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. Oh, well, Ainsley, you've left us on a sad note, but that's okay because oh, it's a okay, great I'll, question. I'll, I'll give you a cheerful <laughs> note. So one of my mates uh, who was staying with us was da- swimming down in the local ocean pool and she felt something on her foot and it was a cute little blue-ringed octopus sucking on her f- big toe. Isn't that really bad? Uh, the good news is it didn't kill her. Okay. <laughs> it's a happy ending. But it's see? cute. <laughs> but it was so cute. She felt this beautiful little sucky motion. And it was just sort of having fun saying, oh, I've never sucked on a toe this big. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Carl, great way to end. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Science with Dr. Carl. My name's Lucy Smith. I'll be off the next couple of weeks, but next week, Beck Charwood will be joining you. You can check out previous episodes wherever you get your podcasts, and we are now uploading to YouTube as well, so you can check us out there. This episode was produced by Sarah Harvey. We'll catch you next week. Bye. Dave Marchese here from the Triple J Hack team. Hey, if you love Dr. Carl's podcast like I do, you might enjoy the Hack podcast as well. Each day we bring you the news that matters to you, from the latest science on climate change to what's happening in politics and news around the world. The Hack Podcast. It's your daily fix of the news you need to know. Get it wherever you're listening now.